father of the modern cantorate, Solomon Zulzer, whose years date from 1804 to 1890. He served from 1826 for some 50 years as the chief cantor of Vienna. As a young man, he was called to the new Seitenstättergasse Temple, uh, a grand, uh, beautiful structure built uh, in the mid-1820s. And there he set about reconfiguring and restructuring the musical palette of the Jewish community of Vienna. Zulzer did this in a way which is very much in keeping with what we later call um, conservative Judaism here in the United States. And in that I mean he writes uh, in his Denkschrift in 1876, near the end of his career, that um, it was his task to take the ancient sacred tunes of his forefathers and to reshape them and to reset them in the style of his day. The style of his day, of course, being heavily influenced by um, composers such as Mozart uh, and Beethoven and Schubert. And so he goes about uh, reaching out to colleagues, uh, including Schubert. And um, we will now hear an excerpt from Schubert's setting of Psalm 92, which is set entirely in Hebrew. new compositions that he commissioned from his Christian colleagues in Vienna uh, bring together the choral style of the Catholic Church with synagogue chant. Unlike what was done in 1819 with the opening of the Reformed Synagogue in Hamburg, where music was set mostly to German texts uh, in German-style hymns, uh, as he puts it, simply putting a hymn before and after the rabbi's sermon. Uh, he integrated traditional chazanut uh, and the uh, Mycenae tunes, as collected by the Maharil, uh, with this Catholic choral style. But Sulzer is probably best known for the melodies that he wrote albeit in this style of his day, that come down to us, uh, most of which are in the Torah service of uh, most Ashkenazi synagogues, uh, including his uh, Ki Mitzion Tetzei Torah, beginning with the text Vayihi Bin Soa Ha'aron, which we will hear now, albeit with orchestra, um, but he wrote it actually with organ accompaniment. Speak about are Israel Lovi 
and then Samuel Nomber. Both of these figures straddle and are amid the life of Zoltzer in Vienna. Israel Lovi, who was born in 1773, died in 1832. His time period is actually almost the exact dates of Ludwig von Beethoven. Lovi's music appears in 19 different manuscripts. There are 96 different compositions of Lovi. Later, Lovi's music does get published. What we do find in the manuscript music of Lovi, which is at the very beginning of the 19th century, shows the style of music that our previous presenter discussed in the Mishorim tradition of the Hazan, the singer, the boy singer, and the bass. Lovi wrote that style of music in plenty, and then he was one of the first people to actually do choral, choral music. And this is in 1818, developing in 1820, in a time period that does predate Zoltzer. We're going to hear now one of the later compositions in the life of Lovi, a Psalm 24, a Susha Orim. This particular text is sung when the Torah is put back into the ark on a weekday during the holiday. So, so. like character to it, with the harmonization to the melody, but not with a great deal of counterpoint. Now, Lovi died in 1832, and Nomberg, who was born in 1815, died in 1880, trained in South Germany, didn't come to Paris until 1843. So this date of 1843 is 11 years after the death of Lovi. And Nomberg comes to the synagogue, the Paris synagogue, that Lovi was in. And we don't know much what happened during the time period between Lovi and Nomber. Most accounts are that the developments of the beautiful music of Lovi started to wane, and Nomber came in at that time. Nomber comes into Paris at the invitation of the famous composer Jacques Fromenthal Lovi. And Nomber publishes his first volumes in Israel in 1847, and much like Zoltzer, commissions others to write music. Now, what's interesting about Nalberg and his music is that he takes the stylization of the Parisian opera and takes it to a great degree and writes really quite dramatic music. As we'll hear in this example, the same text as we heard in Lovi, a Psalm 24, in this Susha Arim, we'll hear a very, some very dramatic moments when the choir is singing in an undertone and the cantor sings above. discussing today, the music that appears in their, man, in their uh, publications from the high holidays does make use of the new song, does make use of traditional uh, melodies, but does so in an innovative way. And in Nomberg's case, he makes the melodies front and center, and the harmony really helps to support that. And what's fitting about the lives of Lovi and Nomberg is that they brought the German tradition to Paris. What makes Paris so interesting is that the reforms began in the late 18th century. Emancipation begins in France and then comes to Germany. And what we find throughout the 19th century is that there is a great interplay between these different countries through these different composers who move throughout these regions. I'd like to talk a little bit about Louis Lewandowski and what's interesting is what Cantor Brian Mayer said in terms of Solomon Sulcer. And I agree with you that Solomon Sulcer was probably the pioneer in many, many ways of setting the tone um, for organ, for choir, for cantorial music. But in many ways, Louis Lewandowski was the champion. And we will see 
momentarily why with some illustrations what made him really uh, so good and also in the way how his music survived given the fact that he died in 1894 and this being the year 2012 some of his pieces are still done throughout the world. Just a very very brief background information Louis Lewandowski was born 1821 in Posen. We're going to fast forward the story very quickly in the sense that by the time he was at the age of 12, he came to Berlin not to study cantorial music, but to further his music education. He was really interested in secular music of all, and some of the early examples are some of the songs and music that was notated in the Liederbuch, the music book from Abraham Idelson. We will see that Lewandowski wrote a song called Abendgrüße, uh, evening greetings, or guten Abend, good evening. We also see uh, an example of es donnert, okay, meaning it is thundering or es gewittert. What also impressed me about Lewandowski was the fact that he also wrote two pieces that really caught my eye. One was Hooray for die Deutsche Fahne, Hooray for the German flag. This, of course, he wanted to be very, very patriotic, incorporated into uh, German society. And another piece that he uh, wanted incorporated is Deutsches Land verliebt. And what it talks about essentially is in the north, south, east, or west, one day German will be unified together for once and for all. Well, this was kind of very interesting in, in the sense that here's a guy who I grew up with listening to his music, and who wrote Al Tashli Heinu Lifanecha Kochecha or Shema Koleinu, music that migrated because of the Shoah um, to two German congregations in New York City, one in Habunim and one in Hebrew Tabernacle in Washington Heights. But that's fast track. This is the book that Lewandowski wrote. He, of course, is Jewish music, Toda Vazimra. He wrote first Kol Tifila in 1871, followed by Toda, two volumes of Toda Vazimra in 1876 and 1882, respectively. Lewandowski's main job was at the Oranienburger Straße Synagogue. The synagogue itself does not exist today. The actual building does. The building opened in 1866. Um, and there was also a big discussion of what this new big synagogue should be. Should it have an organ? Should it not have an organ? But the reality was it was incorporated in 1866 as part of the service. But if you look at the correspondence, there was a lot of tension about this. And to be realistic, in 2012, that's still... A, a situation today. Thank you, Ralph. Um, before we leave Lewandowski, let's just listen to a little excerpt of some of Lewandowski's music. I'd like to, in, in, the, in the last minutes here, see if we can draw some connections among the various musicians and musics that we've been speaking about. And, and maybe the, the nexus here might be the question of accompaniment. Um, Rossi's music was performed without any accompaniment. We know that his rabbi did not try to justify the use of instruments, and we're fairly certain that it was performed, as we would say today, uh, a cappella. We see that Zulzer begins being anti-organ, but then towards the end of his life, he's in favor of the organ. One of Lewandowski's first arguments is that there should be an organ. I'd like to turn to Tina now, because she is, I think, the expert on the use of the organ in uh, German synagogues in the 19th century. Tina, tell us about the organ controversy in, in two minutes or less. If we talk about the introduction of the organ, we, we don't want to think of one singular event, but 
we want to think about a series of events that had um, kind of early occurrences in Italy and also in Prague. The, the organ is usually used as a barometer for modernism. It's not really the only barometer to apply, truly. Um, I have a few comments that I want to make in this con context, um, especially after listening to my colleagues. Um, first of all, it seems to me that modernism in synagogue music means, in all the cases that we have discussed this afternoon, it means always bridging two identities, the Jewish one and the other identity, the other meaning um, identities of respective environments, be, be it Italy, be it Berlin, be it Paris. Well, we've looked at the tip of the iceberg of the subject, but I would like to thank our panelists uh, for a very enlightening session and uh, look forward to chapter three of the top ten composers of Jewish music. Mm -hmm.